Hi, this is Jess. I'm here with Russ and Father Carl to discuss um, grooming and the need for connection. Um, there was a situation in my life that has brought it up, so we figured it would be a good episode to um, bring up. What is grooming? Grooming is when someone takes advantage of somebody else's legitimate needs. So for example, what do we mean by legitimate needs? A young person might need uh, input from a father figure or a parental figure of some kind, or the young person might need friendship. And a groomer takes advantage of those little legitimate needs to form a connection with the potential victim and later to introduce the potential victim to things that they didn't expect at all, which is sexual, uh, some kind of sexual uh, behavior. I agree with you, Russ, but the other um, situation where you could run into is um, that some other people do it and they shouldn't be labeled as groomers just because they exhibit some of these behaviors, but there are other warning signs that happen. And um, a couple of the warning signs that happen is um, with my own life experience and a few that I saw through a situation just a couple a month ago with my own son. Um, the first one was my son for a period around Christmas till then is if you're not seeing anything, it's not there. And I didn't understand why it was. There was a behavior challenges. He started being really um, obstinate with his teachers and his peers. And I wasn't sure what was going on. So after talking to you for great lengths in time, with what you said, the great need for friendship in a father figure, my son was at rest. Do you agree or disagree? Certainly, your son, uh, in the absence of a, of a father figure, your son will be hungry for father input. And, and the, the really important thing is mothers can't father their children. Fathers can't mother, can't mother their daughters. You know, there's a, there's a certain gender need same gender need for parenting and that's where uh in the case of your son a, a male van driver could have an appeal to your son because your son would be searching for men that he can respect that he can get to know that he can have friendship with and so forth in the same way that he would search for that from a father and that's what he told me he said he would never tell and because he was like his best friend there's no way he would tell, even though he was unsure. And you can see right there how the groomer has already trapped, this, in, your, in this case, your son. You know, there's the, the groomer forms an emotional connection with the son that the son needs, and the son becomes loyal to the groomer. And so even as the groomer moves toward introducing other things that the son is not interested in, the son will have difficulty reporting that or, or talking about that. Because he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to lose the friendship or the father input connection. And that's similar in my case because um, Father Keen, who ran the House of Affirmations, was the masterminder of grooming. Um, when I was even a child at his age, I remember going to the school this September and asking my son over and over again, where's your speech therapy room? And he put me on a roundabout up and down about three flights of stairs and he wouldn't show me where the speech therapy room was. So then I realized that Cain was taking his maintenance workers which were very young and some were a little bit older. So the ones that were older were actually working in school systems and he could get into those school systems. Now that's masterminding grooming, isn't that? That's what not really do? grooming. That's, uh, right. Well, we could say, we could say that uh, he was, uh, Kane, first of all, was involving himself with young men that he was hiring. Uh, and in that sense, he was grooming them. Uh, in the sense that he he was using them to uh, uh, 
contact students in a school, uh, we could say he was grooming them to be groomers, if you will, right? Uh, so, yeah. Well, what he did with the boys were worse than that. I mean, a lot of the boys that abused me were um, abused by Cain or what I call his minions or the people who he found that were um, the qualities of being abusers themselves would abuse. So he got a hold of the bishop. He got a hold of a lot of people. I mean, he really did a lot of damage to um, Catholic Church and maybe others because I even know he somehow got into like somehow some kind of Jewish thing too. Russ, what do you think? Okay, so what I'm remembering is what how Jessica talked to me about how uh, Cain and his lieutenants were, uh, were using young men, grooming young men to abuse Jess. And what was the way they were doing that is they were uh taking advantage of the of these young men's questions about their own sexuality so they had this so-called sexual test and and uh and and the boys would uh would again uh, be taken advantage of by someone they respected this priest this priest psychologist supposedly uh and and then would perform for him in order to please him but in the process we're being groomed to be used in uh in jess's sexual abuse and, and what's most important here is you can feel the needs of the young men and how they would given those needs and given their respect for a uh, a, a priest psychologist figure father figure would do things in order to please him. And with the knowledge and master manipulating kids in the school system, Boy Scouts, through the diocese, they did some huge damage in the 80s and 90s to the point where it turned into a sex porn sex ring, just the same as my own son. So I thank God the protections are in place right now. So for me, uh, my experiences started at the age of four when my grandmother's friends who were um, priests and brothers and deacons would come to the house and they would act like they were helping me because I screamed a lot under the kitchen table when I saw any male. Um, and then it magnified by five and six because right after my mom got married to my father, I ended up meeting um, Father Kane and his friends through us moving to our town, which kind of magnified the situation. So the power of what priests can hold and be over the top, right, Father Carl? Yes, indeed. Um, yeah, speaking from the point of view of a religious congregation where we've had uh, men credibly accused of sexual abuse, and the stories that I've picked up as well along the way is the power, really, that uh, priests have in front, in, in front of parishioners or in front of the people they serve uh, and that's true for any authority figure, actually. Uh, but uh, I, what's close to me, because I'm a priest and I've worked with guys who have credibly abused children in the past, so I do know a little bit about what they've done and how they've done that. And part of it is uh, the way that they would reach children through their families, so through their parents. And uh, they would go to their parents, the, they would become close family friends. And they would go to the parents' house for dinner. They would go there, sometimes it was a regular thing, a particular one I remember. Uh, and he would get to the children there. He would, while he's in the house, he would, maybe the daughter is in her bedroom or whatever, and he would just knock on the door and just say goodnight or something like that. 
So, um, and then in one case uh, with another person, another priest, uh, he would take younger people out, I'd say preteens and te early teens, like to go to a ball game, um, and he used um, things like alcohol, which was great for kids who said, who were allowed to use alcohol, they couldn't do that at home, uh, maybe get them a beer or something like that, and he would start like that, uh, and uh, or other kinds of treats. Uh, and then from there, he would he would go from there, building this trust with them. And what's, what's extraordinary, of course, he, telling these stories and knowing these stories is horrible. Uh, that peop, men or women who have dedicated themselves to God and to God's people would ever do such a thing to anybody. And it's shameful. Uh, but uh, it is important, I think, for, all, for us, particularly on our side of things, to be able to to um to read excuse me to read the signs when they happen and um it's important for us to talk to those who have allegedly been abused by these men uh in order to get what's going on and it's important for us to investigate thoroughly in these cases um uh which we try to do i think uh to get at not only the harm they've done to this or that particular individual but the harm they could have done to others. So power, the, the sense of respect that um, can be taken advantage of um, by priests. Um, Pope Francis calls it the sin of clericalism. And uh, that is when priests have this unmitigated power in front of people uh, and, um, and it happens that way. It happens not only with kids, can it happen also too with employees in a, in a church? It can happen to kids, um, older kids who might have a high school attached to a parish. Uh, by and large, uh, there's a lot of good men out there who are good priests, but you do have a few like this. And it's really important to be aware of, uh, in their training, that they be aware of how this this trust that they're given by people which is almost unconditional in some ways uh, can be easily misused and they have to be very humble about it and they have to be they have to have a strong spirituality that understands that they're there for service and not to fulfill just their own needs so for this power trip among those who may in uh, may be priests and do these kinds of things or any authority of figure uh, this power dynamic is very very strong and it even spills over into emotional abuse i've run into deacons and in churches who have had gone through trauma with their pastors who's who gets who goes on this anger this rage kind of thing um, and is very controlling very manipulative and these things can be part of the story too so they can involve sex but the power ranges uh, across the spectrum mm -hmm. and um so it, it's so important in the training of priests and in the ongoing formation and education of priests uh, that these things come to light it just really wants to know how we can uh, prevent this or how we can intervene in a way that stops this. And I think it really begins on the parental level. In other words, all parents need to pay attention to what's happening in the lives of their kids. And Jess, do you want to comment on that in terms of what happened with, with your son? Yes, because I questioned him most days. I knew that he was very interested in games with my son, the van driver and a few other things. And then another warning sign was, if you can't see it, it didn't happen. Like the time where he spilled a cup of milk on the floor and he blamed the dog. And there was millions of other things I could say, but the most concerning thing was he was sick the week that this all went down. That Friday when we were having a family movie night, 
he shouts out some things that were disturbing. And then I started questioning him more frequently. And he even looked at me and said, you're my mom. If you ever did this to me, I would not tell anybody. And it scared me. So I'm very grateful for both of you because you helped me to try to notify the school and notify the wonderful police department who um, was a good help and also the Department of Services. They were a huge help in saying that they do want protection for the kids and aid for the um, kids who are handicapped on a van or um, some kind of security that could protect these kids. And I'm in full advocacy work in my town that we put as much protection with special needs kids as they can. So there's no question that this will ever happen again. You also mentioned that there was uh, the idea of having a video uh, recording device on the bus so that, so that bus activity would always be recorded, you know, as a way of, of seeing inappropriate behavior early on. And that, that, that would require, of course, the video, but also <clears throat> require somebody taking the time to view all this material, but it would certainly be a way of stopping, arresting early on something that seems inappropriate. But they have to weigh the consequences as an aid versus um, right. a video right. system. Right. But children should be protected at all times. I am fully in a crypts because I could see how everything, I am so blessed to have an experience where I could see all the slips in the cracks and the crevices. And I'm very grateful for my parents who are great to put in all this too. So after we start all the next podcast, it's people who are making a difference in this world, who's making an impact or anything else people might want. Thank you so much for listening. And I um, hope you all well. And Russ or Father Carl, do you have anything to add? No, I just appreciate the opportunity just to be here and to journey with you and you and your family. By the way, uh, for those of you who are interested, uh, Jess would love to hear from you. And you can get back to her on the comments section of the Spotify podcast sheet. Uh, and if you would like any other kind of information that would help you in this regard, please get a hold of Jess. She'd love to hear from you and to talk with you. Thanks, everybody. Bye.